Hello and welcome to this edition of This Week in British History with me, Philippa Lacey Brewell from British History Tours. And this week we're covering events between the 8th and the 14th of June. Now, as always, I can't cover everything that happened in this week because that would be huge. And anyway, we can keep this series going for years and years and years and years. So anything that I've not covered, I apologise but I'm not, it's not my intention to try and cover absolutely everything. However, saying that, hopefully in here, I have topics that are either already something you are interested in, plus other ones that maybe you haven't heard of, but are equally as interesting. So, have fun, I hope you enjoy. Let's get started. <music> But before we get started, let me just remind you, if you are looking for a daily hit of history as well, then you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. And I'm also beginning to use my Pinterest more. <laughs> I've been there for a while, but I am making more of an effort to use Pinterest. Um, so you can find me there on all those channels as British History Tours. Also, if I get to a thousand subscribers, I am going to begin a mini series on the monarchs of England and Britain specifically on how we got from each to the next and the stories all around the successions each time because it's never as simple um, as kind of just reading a list of the monarchs so there's a story behind each of those transitions and so I am really looking forward to doing that mini series so if you haven't hit subscribe please do because when I get to a thousand I'm going to begin that series as well as this week in British history but now let me not keep you waiting any longer let's begin with the 8th of June on the 8th of June 1793 saw the first Viking raid of England now it's not the first time they had visited English shores but this is the first time that they had done a seriously a uh, destructive raid and it was on Lindisfarne Priory. Lindisfarne is a tidal um, island, in other words it is linked by land at low tide and is cut off from land at high tide um, off the Northumbrian coast, so off the northeast coast of England. Now the Priory on Lindisfarne was intimately connected or is intimately connected with the, uh, Christian with the rise of Christianity in this country. It was established in the 7th century when in 623 the Northumbrian king at the time, Oswald, asked a monk called Aidan to come over from Iona over in Ireland and establish, well come over to be his bishop and then and he could establish a priory on Lindisfarne. By the time of the Viking raid in 793 Lindisfarne had become a very prosperous and wealthy priory and that is in no small uh, thanks to a monk there called Cuthbert. Cuthbert had joined the monastery, he had become a monk bishop, he had tried to bring in reforms to the priory, that caused some tension and he actually ended up going away um, to another island to live as a hermit. However, he had to come back to Lindisfarne in 685 when the then king made him bishop. Cuthbert died in 687, but 11 years after his death, they decided to open up his tomb and they found that his body was still perfectly formed and they took this as a sign of his purity. So his coffin was lifted to, to ground levels and a ground shrine created to him. Not long after, miracles began to be reported at happening at the tomb of Cuthbert. The cult of St Cuthbert grew and it attracted pilgrims, it attracted the wealthy nobles and king's patronage and so the priory itself became very wealthy. So by the time the Vikings came to raid there were plenty of treasures for them to pilfer. Over the centuries, the monastic order on Lindisfarne suffered many Viking raids, eventually withdrawing to the mainland for safety. That safety lasted only until the north became a battleground between Scotland and England during the reign of Edward I. 
for the majority of the time though there was a, a monastic establishment over on Lindisfarne even though the mother house had been established in Durham on the mainland. And so through Viking raids and open warfare in the north the monastic order of Lindisfarne had survived. That was of course until the total suppression of all monastic houses under the reign of Henry VIII between 1536 and 1541. Lindisfarne was one of the first to be suppressed in 1537. It wasn't, however, dismantled like many of the other monasteries were, and that is because of its physical location. It was considered potentially useful as a defensive position against foreign raiders. However, it was subsequently left to decay. But you can go and visit Lindisfarne Priory. It's run by English Heritage now. Just make sure you check the tide time. On the 9th of June 1549, the first Book of Common Prayer was adopted in the Church of England. With the Protestant king, albeit a young one, and his Protestant council, the Reformation in England in religion had taken on a pace. This Book of Common Prayer set out daily services and Sunday services, as well as um, services for christenings, baptisms, um, funerals, weddings, but importantly it was in the English language. The majority of churchgoers may not have been able to read the Bible for themselves, but now they were hearing the language of the Bible in their own tongue, allowing for what the Catholic Church had not allowed non-clergy to hear and potentially interpret the words of the Bible themselves. On the 10th of June 1540, Thomas Cromwell was arrested at Westminster. Thomas Cromwell was a shrewd politician, he was a skillful administrator, and he had gained and retained favour with Henry VIII, even on the downfall of his um, initial master, Thomas Wolsey. He became Henry's principal secretary, he became Henry's man to make things happen. Cromwell had built such influence, he held no less than 25 offices of state and man with such personal power in a court built on personal power and influence could not go without making some enemies. These enemies circled and wasted no time taking advantage of Henry's displeasure over his fourth marriage to Anne of Cleves. The famous Holbein portrait of Anne, Holbein being known for his ability to paint likeness, even if like a modern day photographer, a flattering one. In typical Henry style, it was unlikely that it was Anne's looks or Cromwell's match that was to blame, but other events which caused embarrassment and therefore anger in Henry. First, their initial meeting between Anne and Henry. Anne had clearly not been sufficiently briefed on the English tradition of courtly love. And second, by the fact that Henry did not or could not consummate their marriage. Of course, Henry blamed that on the repulsiveness of Anne herself, and yet it could have been that Henry was already having issues, reference to which had been made during the trial of his brother-in-law, George Boleyn, in 1536, during the events to rid himself of his second wife, another Anne, Anne Boleyn. Now, this may have been the beginning of Cromwell's um, fall, but it was not as decisive as it sounds, because Henry actually made Cromwell Earl of Essex. However, this appointment only added fuel to the fire that his enemies were already feeling against who they saw as a low-born upstart in their midst. Thomas was arrested at 3 p.m. as the Privy Council came to meet at the Palace of Westminster. He seems to have been shocked and had no idea that there were forces working against him. He was charged with treason and taken straight to a boat that took him to the Tower of London where he was imprisoned. Cromwell had been on the other side of this many times before. He must have known that there was little hope. The onus was always on the accused to prove their innocence, not anyone else to prove their guilt. In any case, a bill of attainder was passed against him on the 29th of June, accusing him of corruption, heresy and treason. A bill of attainder allowed for the forfeiture of all his worldly goods, which had actually already been taken soon after his arrest and his execution without that inconvenient requirement for any judicial process. Cromwell's only hope was a pardon from the king, but despite desperate letters to the king, Cromwell was executed on the 28th of July, incidentally the same day that Henry was marrying his fifth wife, Catherine Howard. 
But despite not being a nobleman at birth, Henry did commute his sentence to just a mere beheading instead of potentially being hung, drawn and quartered for treason or being burnt at the stake for heresy. Although it took three strikes of the axe to sever Thomas's head from his body, there's no evidence that the executioner was either drunk or had been paid to botch the execution as has been told in some of the fictional accounts of his execution. His head was displayed on Tower Bridge as a traitor until it was reunited with his remains and he's buried in St Peter ad Vincula, the same place as Thomas More and Anne Boleyn. Let's do something a bit lighter to finish off. <laughs> 10th of June 1829 was the first Oxford-Cambridge boat race. The boat race was the idea of two friends who had attended Harrow School together, but after school one of them had gone to Oxford and one of them had gone to Cambridge. The idea seems to have been willfully and immediately adopted by both universities and the first race was held on the 10th of June 1859 on the river at Henley-on-Thames. Oxford comfortably won the race, which was then held at irregular intervals until 1856 when it was held annually, pausing only for World War I, World War II, and unfortunately this year for the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of This Week in British History. They go live every Sunday, so thank you for joining me. Please join me next week. I would love to see you. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. When I get to a thousand subscribers, I'm going to do my mini series on the monarchy. And um, come along to Instagram, Facebook if you want to see more daily doses of history. Next week, I'm going to be doing a Magna Carta special because it will mark the anniversary of the sealing, not signing, very, very important, the sealing of the first edition of Magna Carta at Rennie Mead. So I hope you can join me for that. But for the me in the meantime, take care. Keep safe. I'll see you all next time. Bye.